So um, here we are. Um, uh, I was last here in December, and um, being a humbug, I'm glad that we're this side of the um, busy festive season. And um, there we go. So before I begin, again, I must take this opportunity to thank Sister Kathleen Maguire of the Sisters of Our Lady of the Missions for her help with um, my research. Um, she just lent me all her stuff, so she was very brave, but I did give it her back. And there was a great booklet on the history of St Mary's School, which was written by Nicola Waddington. Um, it's been invaluable. And also, um, the other day I was contacted by Colin Barrell, um, a deal historian, and um, I must say thanks to him because he's given me some brilliant pictures that I didn't have. I have included them in here, which is a, a little, um, I'll show you as I get there. But he gave me some more information as well, so I tried to slot that in where I could. And um, there is a period of this where it gets a little bit muddly and um, for me as I was researching it and he helped me a bit with that as well. So thanks to Colin Barrell, much appreciated. But in December, um, I left the story when Catherine Boys, who was the founder of the Deals Orphanage, she just passed away. And her legacy was not only the orphanage, where she had looked after the poorest of children on a meagre budget, but she also brought the Catholic faith back to the town by opening a small chapel in Duke Street and gave over a room of her house for worship. And just before she died, she provided a home for, and she had also helped, the Sisters of Our Ladies of the Missions who needed a safe base away from the turmoil in France at the time. And they helped Catherine look after the children when she became too frail. And um, sadly, when she died in 1872, the, the town stood still to mourn her passing. And many townsfolk gathered at Hamilton Road Cemetery as she was laid to rest. And her orphans, who she loved dearly, they threw flowers onto her lowered coffin. And... Um, so basically it was all back to business after the funeral really, they, they still had the children to look after and um, it was the, they went back to raising money to look after the orphans and this continued in the house here that we can see and um, the sisters were still led by the mother foundress Euphrasie Barbia who had instigated the move to deal and there she is. So we know that the sisters continued to provide a basic education for the children in their care, just as Catherine had. And um, my research has shown that most of the 1870s were spent raising funds as the orphanage that it received no government funding. And I've read that it's completely down to the sisters' ability to raise funds that the orphanage survived and grew into three thriving schools. Um, I thought I'd also just do a, just a little aside, but the two notable early benefactors um, was not that. Oh, there we are. <laughs> um, there's Augusta Fitz Allen Howard, the Duchess of Norfolk, which was the lady on the left. And I couldn't find out much about her, but this, this lady here, um, she was Lady Georgiana Fullerton, and she was a novelist, a philanthropist, and a biographer. And Georgiana had lost her only son when he was 21 and she was overwhelmed with grief and her and her husband remained in a permanent state of mourning throughout their lives and she devoted the rest of her time to philanthropy and charitable works. And I found this um, interesting little bit, it's that one of the young girls at the orphanage who actually went on to become a sister, she remembered Georgiana and she said she would come to visit us when she was staying at Dill Castle always carrying a large bag out of which we all took turns to draw a toy. And I just thought that was really sweet because I think we've all known somebody like that that turns up with the toys. And she must have just been really sad having lost her own son. And the sisters also raised money from tourists to the town and from convents outside of the United Kingdom. And this went as far as New Zealand because Euphrasia had actually been to New Zealand and set up a convent out there as well. And although they still struggled, they never wavered in their determination to serve the poorest of deal. I don't think they ever really lost sight of where they wanted to go with it. And around um, 1878, the sisters knew that Queen Anne House would no longer serve the needs of the growing orphanage. And with the help of their benefactors, including the Bishop of Southwark, um, they purchased Turret House. Now, I've got loads of pictures of different buildings that have stood on the site. So hopefully, I think that's Turret House. 
but if it isn't, apologies. But I just thought I'd put a, like a then and now picture because this is where it stood here. Um, obviously, you know, lo long gone now, but that's, um, it was on, on the corner of, um, there. So it's on the West Street and Park Street. And the building was named after the turrets, which had by then been removed. And once again, a little aside here, it was owned by Mr. Norman, who had had a farm. And unbeknown to George, he's actually quite linked into this, really, with his story of the brewery and this ordnance survey maps as well. And the farm extended as far as St. George's Churchyard on one side and the old brewery in the high street. So, um, thanks, George. <laughs> and it said, um, I also read that, interestingly, this building had cellars and blocked off passageways that were rumoured to have been used by smugglers. And obviously that then links into our smuggling architecture project. And um, I have actually interviewed a lady who did go to the convent and she remembers going down into the tunnels and um, there was, they had like little niches where they used to put candles and that and she didn't know what they were for and there was tables down there. But it, it, does, it does seem that it was used um, quite a lot during the war, so which I'll come back to in a minute. But there was also, this is really interesting as well, there was also a small lookout um, of thick glass that could be seen just by the front door. And it gave a view from above ground, from the cellar. And it says, legend says that this was used by Charles II, who was hiding there after, uh, in 1648, after an abortive royalist attempt to occupy Deal and Sandown castles. So it's one of the things we'll never know, but it's interesting anyway. But um, the bishop, when he gave funds, he said to the sisters that he, you know, he urged them to start boarding school and an elementary school. And um, that, that was his vision and theirs as well. But um, firstly, this new building was opened and blessed on the 8th of December 1878. And it was named after St. Ethelberga. I have got a little picture of No, that isn't her, St. Ethelberga. Ah. She is. And um, she had actually founded a uh, minster at Limage, Limage in the 7th century. So um, that's apparently when um, they started as well. So but that's a bit of a side. So the convent became ever more popular, especially since the 1870 Elementary Education Act introduced schooling for all children up to the age of 12. Parents still had to pay for fees, but the sisters, through their fundraising, they got enough money and they actually covered most of the schooling fees for the children in Deal. And the Act stipulated that all the schools had to be inspected, so not a lot different than now, really. And an inspection report from the mid-1880s um, led to Euphrasie Barbier writing to New Zealand to ask for financial help again. And she says, 10 or 15 pounds towards the building of a dormitory and a school which is absolutely necessary. The government has threatened to close down the school because they consider the rooms too small for the number of pupils we have. We need £500. That was quite a lot back then, obviously. But they, they, they must have done it. And um, an 1887 report shows an orphanage at St Ethelberger's of 80 to 100 children. Um, and they did receive state help for that one. A boarding school for 30 to 35 children and a parish school fronting Park Street for 200 children, for which the convent receives no remuneration, and that was named St Mary's. So the land reached back as far as the rear of um, what was Mark's Spencer's. Um, this is where... This, oh, oh. This is really jumping around tonight, isn't it? Is that, is that one? Anyway, um, but there was included a kitchen garden where the nuns grew their own produce, and there was also a tennis court. And flicking back and forth here, that aren't meant to be, we've got 1871 and 1898, and uh, about 1930s Ordnance Survey map. And you can see, if you see the Admiralty House down here, um, that is actually where the cinema is now. So, um, I can't find. Down, yeah. But that's, that's the... Uh, cinema? Yeah, the, um, the sorry, the was the cinema, Flick Cinema, um, the classic. So that was actually there, that was built on top of there. But the next one, you can actually see it. <coughs> that's 
the next one. There. You see, so you had the convent there, and then the cinema was built there that fronted onto Queen Street. It's the nightclub now. Um, so hopefully I'm going to do a talk on the cinema, so that, that all sort of links into that. But um, also there was a chapel which was built and consecrated in 1902. Um, gateway and now they're in the, the new Aldi so um, that's for them and, and I know they invited Sister Kathleen to, to go and look at them and they, they provided tea and cakes and all that so um, that, that is the original window frame there so um, it seems that Euphrasia and the sisters faced uh, an uphill struggle with uh, more inspections and financial issues for many years the circumstances gradually improved um, for the schools and the convent, and the numbers grew, and the children always took part in town life and celebrations. Now, this is where just a few pictures really, um, it's difficult to put them into order, but I just thought you'd like to see them. A lot of these were from Colin, I think I've got about four. But um, obviously, there's Edwardian times, isn't there? Victorian Edwardian times there. Um, I'm a great one for doing then and now pictures, I like to line things up, that's how my mind works, but I, I just can't really see the, the angle of these, but I just thought they're beautiful anyway. And then that one. Now, I, I think the, the statue might have been from the same lady that um, did the chapel, because I think she gave the statue as well. So that's the Mary's School, so that one must have fronted Park Street. But um, I did ask Mum the other day, because she was brought up in Park Street, but she can just remember a, a big brick wall outside her house. So um, I need to look into that a little bit more. And then that one as well. And I don't know if that's it now. That was going so well then, wasn't it? <coughs> Still not going. No, it's gone far too far now. <coughs> Hopefully. Right, this is um you're crazy. This is her tomb because um she she died on the 18th of January 1893, and it seems that it's sort of everything settled down around this time. But this um she actually passed away in Westby and the Canterbury. And she's buried at St Anne's Convent in Sturry, where all her belongings are. And um, I think it's a real shrine to her there. And although there was a brief period of stability toward the turn of the century, um, peril was never far away, as not only did a terrible influenza outbreak affect the convent and the schools, but the whole country entered into war twice. And in 1940, many children were evacuated to Wales, and some returned for a short while later. And um, the schools remained open to the pupils that had stayed or returned to Dill. Um, the, the children didn't have to be, um, they didn't have to be sort of sent away. So um, some of them just like drifted back. I think they might not have liked, I think they went to Bridgend. I think they might not have liked their life and then they came back. But um, tragically, on the 8th of May, 1942, two children died um, where bombs were dropped in an air raid. It seemed that the, the Southern Railway goods yard just across the road from their schools um, and convent had been targeted. And hopefully we've got... No, I don't know. These are the pictures. I, I did have got a picture of the little boys, but I don't know if it's in, it's in order. But this, I mean, that I'm almost sure is Park Street going down there. And then you can see the building that we've just seen fronting it. Um, Apparently there was like piles of rubble all down, down the street for years. I don't, don't know if my mum remembers, but it was just like piled up for years and until they could really sort of do anything about it. Because obviously there was, you know, th things, it must have just been dreadful. But the two children, I don't know if I can find the picture. <coughs> there they are, bless them. Um, Michael Ryan, who was 11, 
and this is this, is this one him, um, James Francis Rogan, age 12, both local lads, one from um, Cavill Square and one from Mill Road, I think, so very local. But I found this memory from a fellow pupil, a lady called Thelma Brown. It's quite sad, but she's on the 8th of May, 1942. I was travelling by bus with my two oldest sisters to St Ethelberger's convent in Deal. The school was approximately three quarters of a mile from home, and I was just six years old at the time, and I remember the bus being stopped, and we all had to go out to the nearest air raid shelter until the all clear sounded. When it was considered safe, we boarded the bus again and carried on to school. As we approached the school, we were stopped again as a bomber dropped on the playground. My eldest brother was already at school, and he had gone on bicycle, and we had no way of knowing if he was safe at that time. He was lucky, as he had gone to the shelter, but his cycle was badly damaged. Unfortunately, the two boys had gone back to collect their marbles from the playground, and they were killed. And seven others were seriously injured. I just thought that was really heartbreaking, isn't it, that they went to get their marbles, bless them. But anyway, yeah, so you can see the devastations in the pictures, um, slightly out of sync here. But um, this tragedy marked the uh, beginning of the end for St Mary's School on this site because the, the buildings were badly damaged and understandably many of the children didn't want to return to school here. But um, this is where it got a little bit muddled, but this is where it sort of separates, the two separate, and I'll hopefully you've explained it, but several temporary sites were considered, but most of them were unsuitable. Um, but it was St John's Church and St Richard's Road that was finally settled on, and this is a, for the St Mary's School part. <laughs> and um, they screened the altar off during lessons. And some children continued to receive schooling in a small part of Park Street School that had survived to the convent and the convent. But, and that was the secondary school, the convent, and there was also a boarding school. But they continued to operate throughout. Um, the, the sisters had also secured a new base, Beach Court. And Sister Kathleen said to me that they had to get away from the town because it was just too dangerous. They, they didn't know, as we've said before, they didn't know what was going to happen tomorrow. And um, so they found Beach Court in Rectory Road in Upper Dill, and that still is where I we went today, um, now to go and see Kath, um, Sister Catherine. So education continued on the town site until the 1970s, as some of the buildings were rebuilt using post-war funds. But it ended in the mid-1970s, I think it was 1974, and by the early 1980s, the site was demolished and um, cleared for the building of the new Gateway supermarket. Um, and the only building today that remains is the Portery. There. So um, that's what I meant by the cinema. <laughs> so, um, and that had been used toward the end, mainly, for residential accommodation for the nuns, and it's now private flats. Um, St Mary's School continued to be based at St John's Church until it moved to the Glack um, in Glack Road. And I should. There you go. Um, there's a large boarding building <coughs> situated behind Beach Court. And the sisters have bought this building from the military in 1944. And I have read quite a lot that there was a lot of um, military guys that were based up the Glack Road with families. So the families put them up and um, obviously they used this as well. And the school was fast outgrowing the church now. And apparently in the Easter holidays in 1945, the parents and children helped us move the school to here. And um, this is where my mum comes in again, but mum remembers going here to, for piano lessons. And she said to me that she remembers walking up the drive to the big house and being taught to the, the play the piano for one of the sisters. And she received a rap on the knuckles for playing a wrong note. I think it was a ruler, Mum, wasn't it? Not big fan. But um, sadly, and uh, once again, we stood here before, is um, on the 27th of December, 1961, this settled period ended when the lovely building was destroyed by fire, and yet another tragedy for the nuns in the school. And um, once again, the pupils had to be divided up over schools until the area in the area until 1965 when a new St Mary's School was built on St Richard's Road um, and that was on land next to St John's Church so it all sort of fits in really um, and that's where it is today but um, and the direct link to the sisters they, that ended in December 1986 when the last sister to teach at the school left for Australia but they'll always be close um, because they've both grown from the same roots as we've seen here and the modern St Mary's was refurbished a few years ago and an artist was commissioned to design some mosaics 
depicting the history of the school. And I think these bring the stories together perfectly. And I went to the school the other day to take these photographs for you. And um, the, the sun was shining on them and they looked really beautiful. But um, I couldn't take one from a distance, but they're, they're in the playground and they're just all along the wall. And I have got here the artist's words about them. What she did, she involved the children as much as possible in these. <coughs> and, and each of them means something. So hopefully, uh, there's one. So it says, um, each panel represents key moments in the timeline um, of the history of the school. And each design is set within the arch of a church architecture and against the backdrop of the Sacred Heart. The water and fish running through the bottom of each panel helps to give location that, that's still and it's close <coughs> to the sea. The children did lots of drawings toward these panels and they are interpreted into mosaic and used throughout. So the first one here is the Miss Boys Orphanage and it says Miss Boys is celebrated here as the foundation of what became the school as we know it today. As a practicing Catholic, she provided the objects of worship for the children, symbolized in the mosaic by the chalice on the top left, and the top right is a wheat sheaf. Below the hands with rosary beads. The hands also represent Miss Boys giving, and the rainbow behind the orphans is a symbol of hope. There is also green hills to represent the local countryside and the flowers on the hills are actually heart shapes to represent caring and generosity. And then the second one. This is for the Sisters of Our Lady of the Missions. <coughs> this panel is a story of the sisters' journey from France and finding their place in Deal, taking over and developing the work of the orphanage when Miss Boys passed away. The central circular image of the, of the world with a cross and flames are taken from the mission's current logo and both with a French flag to represent their journey from France to England. The lighthouse, a symbol of arriving in Deal. The cherries and apples on the top left and the right hand represent the kinds of food the sisters may have grown in their Kent garden and the background of the fruit, broken china plates, which they may have used to eat from. And then, of course, we've got Surviving World War II. This panel depicts the bombing. The hills with daffodils represent the evacuation of the children to Wales. And the birds, the doves in the corner, will represent the two boys who we know were killed and their souls. The bomber planes were tricky. I didn't want them to be aggressive and dominating the design. So I used pictures drawn from, one year, from children in year one, part bird, part jumbo, part bomber. And this final panel tells the story of the post school With hard work and determination, the school was rebuilt. The words in the title are telling that story. During that time, when money was tight, the children collected nettles, depicted by the nettle flowers in the top right and left-hand corners of the panel. These nettles were sent to London and used to produce medicine, thus the perfume bottle. Manners went toward buying books for the school and records show that the boys are really good at football, which completes the trio of imagery to the left of the tree. The building on fire and the plumes of smoke represent the fire in the early 1960s, which then made way for the building as it stands today. The chestnut tree created by the children by drawing around an actual leaf taken from the front of St Mary's is an acknowledgement of the roots and the growth of the school. So it brings my little story to an end really. So spanning the three centuries, the link to Catherine Boys and Euphrasie Barbia remains. From its humble beginnings as a destitute orphanage for the poorest children in the town, through to this thriving primary school full of children with bright futures and full tummies, their legacy continues. When you drive past St Mary's School, Beach Court in Rectory Road, walk past <coughs> Queen Anne House in Middle Street, or spend some time shopping in Eldie, Spare a thought for Catherine and Euphrasie, the dreadful troubles in France that brought them together and the rich history of dedication and determination associated with these people and places. And I'm sure Catherine would be amazed at the difference the years have brought with them, but I'm sure she would be delighted. Thank you very much. Hi folks, I hope you enjoyed the video. Finally, I'd like to say a huge thanks to all of the History Project sponsors. Without your continued support, None of the good work we do would even be possible.